Hi, I'm Bob Nakbar. I gave a talk today on uh, building an interactive game based on the Jeopardy game using Wolfram language, uh, using various features of the dynamic capabilities of the language. I talked about uh, the process of getting data from the web through an API, uh, designing the model initially for the game, building it piece by piece, iteratively improving it by adding color and improving the fonts, adding sound, and in the end we actually played the game uh, with two real contestants and we used questions about the Wolfram language, uh, some of the new features in, in different parts, and uh, I think everybody had a great time. I had a lot of fun building it and using it with teenagers, which was the original purpose, um, and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a game that I built with Wolfram Language uh, based on the Jeopardy TV show game. Uh, it came up in the context of a, a bunch of teenagers at a retreat and we wanted to have a, an activity on Saturday afternoon and so we said, well, let's play Jeopardy, okay? Uh, we can use topics from the theme of the retreat and stuff like that and I said, cool. And somebody pointed me to a PowerPoint um, template and I said, wait a minute, no. I can make something a whole lot better uh, because I, I know how to use buttons and things like that in Wolfram language. So uh, this is, you know, the result of, of about a weekend's worth of work to put it together. And I will go through uh, the process that I used to, to build the game, to refine the game, and at the end, um, I'm hoping that I have enough time we can actually play the game with you guys. Okay, so... You all know about Jeopardy, or most of you do, right? The TV game where there are some contestants and uh, there's a board with uh, dollar amounts on it that they get to pick and behind it is an answer and they have to provide the question for that answer. And if they get it right, they get that score added, that amount added to their score. If not, somebody else gets to try the an to answer it. And at the end of the game, when all the questions or the clues have been answered, then we see who wins. Um, there are a lot of derivative games out there, uh, you know, as I said, PowerPoint templates, board games, and there are even some do-it-yourself stuff to do it, uh, a lot of them based on PowerPoint, and um, I, you know, wanted to do something that would be more fun and more engaging. So uh, we had a number of constraints, some of them soft, some of them imposed by the organizers of the retreat, some imposed by me. Uh, so, you know, we chose the categories in advance. And uh, we had to handle up to, you know, in the end, I've done this like three or four times now, eight different teams. Traditionally, Jeopardy just has three contestants. Uh, so we had to keep it flexible that way. Uh, I wanted to keep the scoring automatic so there'd be no arguments about who won. Uh, they didn't want to build in timer because it'd be too distracting for teenagers. Um, perfectly res you know, respectable requirement for the design specification. Um, we wanted to be able to play both Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy because in the second game on the TV show, all the amounts are doubled, and then they call that Double Jeopardy. But we didn't want to have to get into the final Jeopardy question, which where they put one question up and everybody, you know, the contestants get to wager what they've won so far um, on that last question, and basically a double or nothing type of situation. We didn't want to do that. Uh, we wanted to use real Jeopardy questions and clues, clues and answers, and it turns out we can do that on the web. And that was a really cool part of this. Um, the uh, clues and answers uh, for the game in the end really need to be, depend on the settings. So, you know, do I want to use clues uh, from real Jeopardy games? Do I want to use them in a classroom setting for, let's say, history or geography or biology? Uh, so it needs to, I wanted it to be flexible for that, and I'm glad I did because, you know, I've used it in, in three or four different settings and with different types of questions, and the teacher would give me, you know, a spreadsheet with questions in it, and I'd have to, you know, get them in and make it work the same way as pulling the questions, for the Jeopardy questions from the website. Um, let's see, uh, we didn't do the daily double feature in the game. You know, it's sometimes when the, uh, the contestants would pick you know, uh, geography for 500, 
uh, it would flash up daily double, and so they would actually have the chance of winning $1,000 instead of just 500 if they got that one right. That was an, an extra layer of complexity that we didn't want to deal with, um, and I didn't have to try to program it. And I also didn't want the uh, players to be distracted by the operation of the game. When I've seen it run before through PowerPoint, there's all the shuffling back and forth, and, and things get out of sync, and I wanted to avoid that. I wanted it to be a smoother experience, easier on the organizers of uh, the event, and certainly easier on the contestants. So w the way I, I went about doing this, I wanted to start with real data. I find that starting with real example data makes it much easier to figure out what you can do, what you can't do, um, and to design what you're trying to build in the end. Um, the, the game board had a category and clue area, and it had a team area for keeping score. Uh, let's see, we had to understand um, the gameplay and be able to design a, a process, what I, um, you know, it's essentially an, uh, an event loop which is modeled on a, a finite state automaton. Those of you from computer science would know what that is. But it's a way of controlling the uh, movement from one state to the next during the game, from uh, question selection time to question answer time to awarding the score time, and then going back and repeat. Um, they're, they're used a lot when you have that sort of situation uh, that you need to control very carefully. And then there's always the test and tweak and test and tweak and debug cycle that you go through at the end. And then finally, we get to play. OK, uh, so the, the basics for the API, um, there is a service called JService out on the web. And uh, it is a REST API. Um, and uh, you, you basically send a URL with a query in it requesting information from the service. And we can ask for uh, information on clues. We can ask for a random clue along with its answer and, and the number of dollars, the value of that clue. Uh, we can get them, uh, we can get categories uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, you can choose all the, you know, build a database basically of all the categories available in the game and they get questions by category. Uh, there appears to be a service where you can indicate that a given clue is invalid in their database, but I've never looked into that. So uh, that's what we were working with. Uh, the, the REST API is described on Wikipedia, and there's a nice tutorial here on how to use it. This API was well documented. That single page there let me do everything that I needed to do. I've seen some other APIs where there's like no documentation, and it's impossible to try to figure out not only how to get the data out that you want, but what data are available. And a lot of times, you know, you, you need to explore to find out what, what you can do. So uh, on this API, we've got clues, we've got categories, and we can have random clues. So just for a couple of examples, uh, let me make sure that I've got everything evaluated. Okay, so we can, um, the traditional way of uh, sending a request for an API in Wolfram language is to use the import command. Uh, and you just give it the URL as a string and you tell it the format that you want back, in this case, JSON. And uh, it converts the JSON into a set of nested rules, which are very easy to work with. The more modern way to do this now is with uh, URL execute. And we can give it the same query. Um, here in uh, the import, we have to tell it that we're asking for, you know, one random query. So we're telling it the counts to be one. With URL execute, we can put these in a little more Wolfram language-like way as a list of rules with property name and then the value for it um, out here, along with any other uh, properties we need to specify, such as authentication and things like that uh, for the, 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 the API. But you can see we're getting the same information back. And uh, we can also ask for categories. So when I ask for it that way, we get back the, the category ID, the title of the category, and how many clues were available uh, in that. The Jeopardy game has reused clues or, or categories. And so sometimes you might find 10 clues or 15 clues in a given category. 
Okay, now there are two different ways I mentioned that you can get, uh, make a request to get the clues with the, the questions, the answers, the values, and the name of the category that they're in. The first way is to make a, a category request, and here we can see that it comes back, uh, first of all, with a list of rules in it and a few other pieces of information. And making a prefix tree here, you can see that we get clues and ID, the title of the category, and the number of clues in it. And then under the clues, we've got all five clues here with their value, uh, the question, the answer, the date that it was aired on TV, um, the category ID to which it belongs, and the game ID. The other way to do it is to make a clues request. We get a slightly different, we get the same information back but in a different layout. And here we get a list of the individual clues with their data and then we have a category property to that clue that has the category information. Uh, for better or for worse, I chose this ladder structure to work with because I was intending to build a database of clues that would have a property being their category. So that was the, the structure I wanted to use. Okay, so let's pull some data and work with it. And one of the first things I noticed was that there are embedded HTML tags. Uh, they seem to be exclusively about italics and, and they would use that for titles of books or songs or things like that. Um, and I didn't want to leave these raw HTML clues in there, so I, I wrote a function called embed, embalic, embed italics to convert the HTML tags into uh, an italic string, basically turning it into linear syntax. Um, so we can see doing that, now Johnny Belinda is written in italics there. Having the structure of nested rules just begs for using associations. And so that's, that's what we did. Uh, and, but to do that, we need to convert a few of the left-hand sides of the rules called the keys into a standard form so they can be used more easily with associations. So anything with an underscore, you know, an underscore in a string is no problem, but an underscore in a Wolfram expression means that it's a pattern. And uh, the um, trying to, to use, we wanted to be able to use these keys in functions that work on associations and there uh, the string had to be without underscores so we could use it as part of the, the as the slot argument uh, in the, in the uh, anonymous function. So uh, we, we, camel, we just camel case them to make it easy. And then um, I wanted to make sure that the, the data we got back, the JSON data, met the, the structure that we needed uh, to turn everything cleanly into associations. And this function here, make associations, does that. So now I can take the query and I have associations, which makes it much easier to work with in terms of pulling the pieces out. So I can get all the keys for the association and I can easily get the title, okay, or I can get the list of clues um, and these are the keys for all the clues. Um, so associations are, are just really nice to work with. And in the end, we can turn them into a data set. Okay, so uh, that's doing everything there. Um, we also need to check to make sure everything is good because in one of our queries, we can see here that one of our values was null. So this database, while it's pretty good, it's not necessarily well curated. For some reason, on this one clue, the value of $300 was dropped. Um, and so what do we do in that case? You know, do we try to fix it um, or do we move on? In this case, I chose we'll move on. There are so many uh, sets of categories available, I could easily choose another category and you know, uh, get it done, uh, get the game built. So um, uh, both forms there, it wasn't good. So here's a, a good set of clues and we can <coughs> test and make sure, it, yes, everything is fine. So, so we're good there. Okay, so I chose five categories to build my game. And it looks like they might be a little bit random, but they're not. So let's pull the data. Okay, I just pulled the data down from the web. I've got five categories, each with five clues. 
these are the categories, pair of dice, lost, little women, story time, dancers, and drinks. And you know, you know that they often have puns in their categories and clues <coughs> and things in the, in the real game, and that's what we're seeing here. And yes, they're all usable, so let's turn it into a data set. And here's a little bit of what it looks like. So uh, we've got the, the values, we've got the questions, we've got the answers, uh, we've got the category title, and so on. Okay, so let's build the game board. So we, we pull out the categories, we'll get the values, and you know we need to lay them out in a grid, so I'm just showing them that way. Here are all the questions laid out and the answers, and we can mock it up pretty easily. So I'm just using um, a flip view, which is a convenient way of just clicking on an expression and getting the next one in the queue, and you just keep cycling. So initially we would see the categories at the top and the values, and then we would see questions, and then we'd see answers, and then we would go back to the full game board with the values to choose the next one. So this is the general layout that we want to use. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have to worry about the event loop, and uh, the, the process of the game is, you know, the uh, contestant picks one of the cells, and uh, the question gets revealed, they answer it or not, um, the score gets incremented if they got it right, and then you go back again uh, to, to do that over. And so here it is the flow of things, um, and once they've answered a question, that cell is now blanked, and you, we shouldn't be able to click on it again, so that it stays here in this blank state. Okay, so button is our workhorse here. Uh, the basic structure of a button is a label and some action that is taken when it's clicked, and uh, so what we're going to do is make the label of the button be dynamic based on the, the current state of the gameplay. And so it will show either the value, it will show the question, it will show the answer, or it will be blank. And so here's just a quick test. So here it is with the value. We click on it, we now have the question. We click again, we get the answer, and we click again, it's blank. And now it is, I'm clicking and it's not doing anything because I have disabled the button in that final state. So we can put it all together into a board. Um, we, get the, we give it the data the data set of our, our, our uh, clues. We um, pull out the, the category IDs, the categories, uh, the values, the questions, and the answers. I'm selecting from my data set with the data set select uh, features, and I'm using outer to build up the array to make sure that I get everything in the right order. I get all the uh, questions, the clues for a given category in that column all the clues for a given value in that row. Um, I'm not counting on the structure of the data coming in to be exactly the way I want it, so I'm, I'm driving it completely internally. Um, I define a function here to uh, reveal the questions and the answers in the full screen. I'm defining a function here to build the game board itself, and then I instantiate the game board and we get to play. So let's define our gameplay function and let's just do it once. And so here is our basic game board. Um, I chose my four favorite contestants, uh, Bob, Carol, Ted, and Alice. If you remember, there was a movie back in the 70s with that title. I see somebody does, that's great. Okay, uh, I like it better than Tom, Dick, and Harry. That's too sexist. Uh, but anyhow, so we can pick drinks for 200. The children's cocktail is ginger ale and uh, uh, grenadine garnished with a maraschino cherry, so what is that? It's a Shirley Temple, okay. Bob got it right, so he gets $200. And we click again and we go back to the game board. It's now blank and we can pick another one. Okay, this is kind of bland. So let's uh, uh, make some improvements. We can improve the font, uh, make them bigger, uh, make them bold so they're easier to read. And uh, we can do it, then add some color to it. And now we've got a background color. I've colored the contestants differently for contrast. And we can even add sound effects. So I 
pull the nice sound off the web so that when I reveal it, our, uh, uh, we, we get the, a little more excitement for the game. And so now when I ask about it, and I can reveal the answer then with a little bit of sound. Okay. We can also take the data from a spreadsheet. And I've had to do that more than once, and Swede has kindly provided me a set of clues. Okay, uh, it was a, a two tabs on the spreadsheet, uh, six rows and six columns, because we've got headings. I can uh, pull out five categories and five sets of clues each. It is indeed usable. Thank you, Swede. I did fix a few typos. Um, and uh, let's turn it into a data set, and now we can play, okay? Uh, this should be good, okay. Um, the first time I played this game, I ended up with a VGA projector, and my nice big uh, MacBook Pro screen went down to 680 by 420 or something like that, and nothing fit. So I've had to deal with a number of different uh, resolutions. So here is our game. And do we have some contestants? Please? OK. Names? Okay, we just barely fit. Okay, Mark, you go first. Okay, I'll take uh, geography for 300. 300? Yeah. This function provides detailed data on all standard map projections. Uh, geolocation? Not quite. Okay. Ashley? Returns an image captured from a connected camera. <laughs> yes. Okay, and you are in first and Mark is in second. So one of the tweaks I added was actually keeping track of who's, who's where. Um, because when you're playing with eight tables of teenagers and it gets really raucous in the room, I can't read all the scores and sort them out in my head. So I, I let Mathematica do it for me. So anyway, um, I'm out of time, uh, but you know, we've got a wonderful game we can play with. You can give it your own categories. If you're a teacher, you can use it in the classroom. Um, you know, if you're a church, you can use it with a youth group. Uh, if you're at a conference, you can use it with your friends. Um, you could even use it with your own family if you want uh, on, a, on a rainy Saturday night. Um, you can pull stuff down from the web. There are a number of things I'd like to do. Um, well, I, there's a whole bunch of stuff I learned along the way. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people like to do top-down design, which is called waterfall. I like to do incremental design, which is called scrum. I, I find it much, much better. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, you know, adding the daily double. Players, we, you know, I'd like to have an interface where we can look at all the categories and pick categories uh, in real time and then play the game. Um, and uh, mistakes happen, so having an undo feature, sometimes I've clicked on the wrong contestant to award the score. Boy, did I get hell for that. Um, and uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more to do. Like I said, this took me about a weekend to do the, for the first cut. Um, I've tweaked it you know, over the past couple of years since I first built it, so there's been some more effort, especially dealing with the screen size stuff. Presenter tools should make that problem go away, crossing my fingers. Um, so that's it. Uh, I've got a minute and a half for questions. Yes? Um, it will be on the conference website. All the code is here in the initialization section. It's all there. Okay? Thank you, everybody.